uh, the power of a name. <clears throat> and, and you'll see in a moment, that's actually the title of our sermon series, our Advent sermon series, The Power of a Name. Um, it's significant. Uh, names aren't just given, they're not randomly given, but uh, for many of us, uh, our names come from uh, just folks really thinking through uh, the season, the time, um, and not just the present, but also thinking about the future. And, uh, and so uh, we had to think through uh, names for our little kids. Uh, we've got two girls. And, um, and, and our second kid's name, because um, I like different. Uh, I, I like to, you know, we, when you say your name for someone to go, well, what does that mean? Where does it come from? And they begin to tell a story. And, uh, and so we decided to name our second kid Kia. Right? Now, most people think it's short for something. They'll think it's, uh, it must be short for kyabet or something like that, you know? And, and then we say, no, 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 it's not. Uh, it's spelled K-E-E-Y-A. And then they'll go, well, where does it come from? And it's, well, it's a, it's a Tswana name. Uh, it's a Tswana word, a very, very old one that uh, isn't, I, I don't think it's used that often. I don't think it's used anymore. Uh, but it means a garden flower. Uh, that's what it means, a garden flower. And so we felt that, okay, uh, this gives us license to pick whatever flower we so desire. And so we chose uh, the black lily. It's not really black. If you go Google it, it's purple in color, but it's referred to as the black lily for obvious reasons. Um, our, our daughter is, is black. Um, and and just, lilies are beautiful. And, uh, and so we wanted her to, to, to always feel that, to always know that, uh, that she's incredibly beautiful inside and, and out. But here's the crazy thing, the crazy thing. Every time we go, uh, we go out uh, into the wild, because uh, my family loves the bush, I think I've shared with you that the bush tries to kill me. Um, but because I love my wife, I'm willing to do it. I'll heavily medicate and we'll go. I'm allergic to pollen and all that kind of stuff. But my family loves it. And so every time we're in the bush or in the wild, we're taking a walk, um, she, she always kind of lags behind. And here's why. It's because she's always picking flowers. And that's like, it's, it's weird. Like it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, we didn't plan it, we didn't. She just, she just has this, this love for flowers. Kia the garden flower. Um, so I just, I wanted to share that. I thought it was pretty cool. Some of you are thinking it's not, but that's, that's on you. I've got the mic. Um, <laughs> one quick announcement before we jump in. Uh, this Christmas, right, December the 25th, we will be having our very first Christmas gathering. Uh, we've never had one before. Um, we normally wrap up around the 16th. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. So I believe it's Sunday the 18th, if memory serves me correct. We will not gather. So we will gather all the way until that Sunday. We won't gather that Sunday. So you guys can go hang out with family, go on a road trip, do whatever it is that you do. Uh, just make sure it's legal. Uh, and then on the Sunday the 25th of December, we're going to gather and have our first Christmas gathering. And so we're encouraging you, if you're in the city, uh, to come. We'll be here, same time, same place. Um, so show up, uh, but also be inviting people to it. Uh, I, I said it last week uh, that there are two seasons in a year uh, that people who aren't Christian, who don't know the Lord, they are willing, willing to gather. Uh, it's Easter and then Christmas Day. And so let's make the most of this opportunity to share with our neighbors and our family members, our colleagues, our friends, folks who don't know Jesus, or maybe they do know Jesus, but they're not plugged into a community. Let's use this as an opportunity. Let's trust God to say, Lord, would you uh, work in this individual's life so that when I make the ask that they would be willing to come so that they might hear the truth of the gospel, the yeah. good news that Jesus came and lived the life that you and I should have lived, died the death that all of us deserve, um, and then resurrected uh, from the grave, and if we put our trust in him, we will be saved. We will have a relationship with Jesus, because that's what we're all about. We want as many people to hear the good news of the gospel. And so be inviting uh, friends and family and neighbors. Um, trust God for your one more. We spoke about our one mores during the Awaken series. Let's continue to trust our God for one more. Who's that one person that you're going, God, uh, just, could you save this person? Yeah. Could, you, could you reach into their hearts and just and save them? Um, so 25th of December, uh, we'll be here quarter past nine for our Christmas Day gathering. The power still hasn't come on. Is that right? All right. I was trying to buy us some time. Um, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to jump into the text. And then at some point, I'm going to pause um, because we're going to be transitioning from generator to ESCOM. 
and, uh, and then I need to turn on the projector. And, and so I'm just prepping all of you so you don't think that's part of the sermon. Um, we kick off our Advent series today. Um, it's where we look back at the coming of our Lord and Savior, uh, where we are reminded of the greatest gift that we've ever received. Um, and so we're going to be spending these next few weeks looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Jonah has already mentioned it. We're going to be swimming in this text uh, as we seek to understand who this Savior is, who exactly is Jesus, and what does that mean for us. We're going to be looking at a few names that Isaiah gives uh, to us when he, describing Jesus, uh, and we're going to be looking at the power of a name. The power of a name. We're literally going to uh, take each Sunday to unpack each one. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, let me read the text, Isaiah uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 6 and 7, uh, and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you, uh, so that you pray for me, that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, hear these words of our Father. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. Yeah. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are ancient words, but they are not dead words. They continue to work. They continue to transform individual lives. And so God, would you do that this morning? Would you meet each and every one of us where we are? We are in desperate need of a savior. And his name is Jesus. And so uh, over this next season, as we begin to unpack uh, the different names that Isaiah gives, Lord, I pray that they would land on soft hearts. Help us, Lord. Lord, I ask that my words would submit to your word. That my heart would submit to your heart. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body Think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king, you are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. The power of a name. See, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 is a prophecy about a future child who will bear the government on his shoulders and be called by titles that can only be rightfully attributed to God. Yeah. But before we unpack all of this, I think it's important for us to know what's going on here in the text. So let me try to give some information. Let me try to set the scene. You see, Isaiah, the prophet, in the book of Isaiah, is speaking to people living in three time periods. Before the Babylonian exile, during the Babylonian exile, and then after the Babylonian exile. And then in chapter 9, Isaiah is speaking to the southern kingdom of Israel. He's speaking to Judah. Judah. See, Israel, the northern kingdom, and Syria are pressuring Judah to form a coalition so that they might go to war against Assyria. Ahaz, the king of Judah at this time, is afraid to go against Assyria, so he sends a king's ransom to Assyria asking them for help. This, this man was a coward. He was a coward and, and, and full of idolatrous worship. And so not wanting to form this coalition, he goes to the enemy and he goes, okay, listen guys, I need your help against these other kingdoms. Isaiah spoke into a situation where Judah felt powerless. And they were afraid of the rulers to the north. As their enemies only seemed to grow in strength and tighten their grasp, they didn't know if God was for them or against them. 
They were wondering, has God abandoned us? See, the Assyrians were on the march, taking people into captivity by the multitudes. So among Isaiah's prophecies about their future defeat, exile, and return, he includes two prophetic visions of a child who will, one, represent God's presence, two, embody his characteristics, and then three, bear the responsibilities of governing his people. And so he says, listen, guys, I know things are bad. I know things are bad, but there's someone who is coming. Isaiah, who is writing nearly 700 years before Christ shows up, is giving the people of God hope in a time when they desperately needed it. This period of history was horrendous. It was horrendous. People had given up and they were doing whatever pleased them. It was carnage. And so he steps in and he says, God, hold on, hold on. There is hope. You don't have to live this way. This is who Isaiah is speaking to in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven. And so with that, let's jump into the text. Verse six says this, for a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders. You see, two chapters before this, Isaiah says, for a child will be born for us. He prophesied the birth of a child whose name would signify the very presence of God. This is not the first time he speaks of this child in Isaiah 9. In Isaiah 7, he says, no, hold on, let me tell you that there is one who is coming. And and his name is going to communicate to us the very presence of God. Let me read it to you. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 and 16 says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive have a son and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. You don't have to live in fear. You can put your trust in God. He has a plan for you. See, Emmanuel means God is with us. And like in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this verse is believed to be a prophecy about Jesus. In fact, the Gospel of Matthew quotes this passage in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, as it recounts the story of Jesus' birth. It's all connected. This prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 is an encouragement that God is indeed on Judah's side. And it's an assurance that by the time this child has grown up, Assyria and Syria will be defeated. Guys, I'm I'm hoping that what you're hearing is is relevant for you today. That that there's different things that put pressure on us today. God is saying, no, no, I haven't left you. I haven't abandoned you. I still love you. He's saying this to these people. And the government will be on his shoulders, which means that he will bear the responsibility of governing the people. Verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 9 clarifies this. It tells us that he will govern his people and he'll do so forever. Again, pointing to the Messiah. There's a lot of people that will go, no, 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 this prophecy was about a a really great king. Some actually say that it it was a a prophecy about about Hezekiah. And and I can see why they would say that, but but Hezekiah didn't govern forever. The man died. This must be the Messiah. It says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7, the dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. So in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the passage I just read to you is actually Isaiah chapter 9 verse 5. In the English Bibles, um, they extended that verse and made it verse six. 
Um, and there's a number of reasons why. It doesn't take away from the fact that God's word is still true. Um, because when Isaiah wrote and spoke these, he wasn't going, and chapter one, let me, he wasn't, he just wrote. And so all these were added later to help us, to help uh, the Jewish folks, and then later to help us. Um, but I just thought it was interesting. Keep going. Fantastic. I was saying all of this wrapped up in the gift of a son. Uh, we're told that the son will be born, which speaks to the fact that he would be fully man, but also given which points to the fact that he is fully God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Isaiah tells us that this son, Jesus Christ, will carry four titles. He will carry four titles. And those titles will carry significant implications for us. And that's why over this Advent, we're going to take a look at each one because they're that important. There is power in his name, and it has massive implications for our lives. And so today we're gonna be looking at the title, Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. He will be named Wonderful Counselor. You see, the word wonderful in this passage literally means incomprehensible. The word carries a much weightier and meaningful explanation than the way it's used in normal conversation today. See, we say things are wonderful when they are pleasant or lovely or at the very least likable. That's what we mean when we say wonderful. However, uh, the word wonderful in Hebrew is pele, pele, which is a word that is not used that often in the Old Testament. And and when it is, 90% of the time, It's expressing something extraordinary. It's expressing something miraculous, something supernatural, something difficult to comprehend. Wonderful. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, In Exodus, uh, after uh, the people of God leave Egypt, led by Moses, remember they get to the Red Sea and they think to themselves, this was a bad move. Right, Pharaoh and his army are right behind them. The Red Sea in front of them, like, like we should have stayed. Like, this is absolutely horrible. We should have never listened to this random shepherd called Moses. And then God opens up the sea. He does something wonderful. He does something extraordinary. He does something miraculous. They are so blown away that in, in Exodus 15, Moses then writes a song about this. And in in that song, verse 11, we see these words, Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? Pele. We see it again in Psalm 77, verse 14. You are the God who works wonders. Pele. You revealed your strength among the people. Psalm 89 verse 5, Lord, the heavens praise your wonders. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. Psalm 119 verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful. They are pele. Therefore, my soul keeps them. Jesus Christ will and should cause us to be full of wonder. That's the point that Isaiah is making here as he gives this title. He says that he should, he should cause us to be full of wonder. Jesus is wonderful in a way that is mind-blowing. Jesus is extraordinary. Jesus is miraculous. Jesus does that which is supernatural. He is full of wonder. Jesus deserves the acknowledgement and honor of this title. He does. He deserves it. Pele, wonderful. See, Jesus demonstrated his wonderfulness in various ways. If we look at the life of Jesus, he demonstrates his wonderfulness in various ways. What Isaiah prophesied about, we know experientially. Right, because Jesus came and lived the life that you and I should have lived. There's accounts of Jesus. And so Isaiah prophesies this, but we go, no, 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 we know. We sit here and we go, yeah, yeah, we know he's wonderful. But but I think many of us forget. We we forget. We're such forgetful people. 
And so let me unpack a few, a few ways in which Jesus is wonderful. See, when Jesus was here on earth, his beginning, his conception in the womb of a young virgin was wonderful. It was supernatural. It was miraculous. And friends, this should tell us something. Not only is that Jesus Lord and Savior fully God, not, not only that, but, but that means that Jesus can bring new beginnings to your life in miraculous, supernatural, extraordinary ways. And I tell you this because many of you are sitting here going, man, I, I, I need something new in my life. Oh, I need someone new in my life. Just ha hashtag, I'm not talking about your marriage. Um, <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get to another place where, 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 where Jesus is wonderful for that. But, 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 but I say this because I know, I know there are many folks in here pr praying, praying for a child. And, and you've been told over and over and over again, not going to happen. Jesus is wonderful. He's wonderful. He revealed he was the wonderful one in his power to heal over and over and over again. Amen. Why am I telling you this? Because I know that sitting here are people filled with brokenness. Brokenness. And you need healing. Yeah. Not just physical healing, because I know in here folks need physical healing. But, but, but spiritual healing as well. Mm. Or maybe it's, it's a relationship that's broken. And you need that to be healed. You need that to be restored. You need reconciliation. Friends, Jesus is wonderful for that as well. Yeah, amen. Amen. And so maybe you've just forgotten. Amen. Maybe you've just, that's why you're trying to turn st stones to, to, to bread. Right? Like Satan comes and tempts you the same way that he tempted Jesus. Hey, t turn, turn this to that. It's like, yeah, let, me, let me try to figure it out on my own. Let me try. No, 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 no. Man does not live on bread alone. I'm going to put my trust in the wonderful one who is able to heal any and every broken situation in my life. He's wonderful because of his mind-blowing teaching. Some of us, we, just, we need knowledge. That's what we lack. We struggle to trust because we don't have the knowledge. And so you go to all these different places hoping that you'll find knowledge. But, but friends, I'm telling you, everything that you need is here. Yeah. Amen. I'll unpack that Amen. in a moment. His perfect life in the ability to live a sinless life in a sinful world. I mean, that's miraculous because yeah. you know you. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're like, I know we're, we're heading into Christmas and then the year comes to an end and then we start 2023 and each and every one of you has goals and new year resolutions and here's how I'm going to live my life better. 2023 is for me. <laughs> and you don't even get to the end of the month and you're like, I failed. <laughs> like I tried and... We, we live in a very difficult world, a very difficult one, and, and, yet, and Jesus lived in the same world and yet did not sin. Yeah. This is for anyone in the room who, who feels like, like sin so easily entangles you. That you're trying, you're doing everything that you can to get out of this situation. You're, trying, you're like, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do that again. But, but who am I going to put my trust in? Because I'm not good enough. And those three things that, that the pastor gave me that all rhyme and all start with like the same letter and it's super cool and like that's what I'm going to put my trust in. No. You put your trust in Jesus, the, the wonderful one, the wonderful one who is able to do the supernatural, who's able to say, you know what, I can move you from that situation. Whatever that circumstance is that's holding you down, I can remove the chains. But maybe, maybe we've just forgotten. He is miraculous in his resurrection. Mm. Hallelujah. What are the dead things in your life that you need Jesus to raise to life? 
And here's where I insert the marriage. Because I know that there are folks here who believe that my marriage is dead. My relationship with my kids is dead. That everything that I put my hands to, it's just, it's like, it's, it's dead. And so I'm in desperate need of a savior who will come and resurrect and there is one who can. And so the question is, will you put your trust in him? Will you see him for all that he is, the wonderful, the wonderful, the wonderful savior? Jesus taught many wonderful things that are so countercultural to the human mind. I believe that's why it's so difficult for people to believe that. It's so countercultural. Let me let me give you a few. Blessed are those who mourn. How? And I know that we don't believe that because I know in here folks are mourning. I know that, guys, let's not pretend. I know. But you'll show up here and be like, no, 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 it can't be true. So everything is great. Pretend and perform. Activate. And as soon as you get in your car, oh, my life sucks. And yet he says here, blessed are those who mourn, that there is space, there is space with Jesus for you to mourn. Rejoice and be glad when he talks about persecution. What? How? How? Like, I'll do everything to get away from persecution. And he goes, no, 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 no. Why are you running? Where are you going? Guys, can I say, can I say this? Can I, let's chat for a little bit. So many of us here, we, we pray for strength. God, would you give me strength? Whatever it is, persevere for whatever. Just give me strength. And then he goes, okay, I'll answer your prayer. H- how do you get strong? For folks who, who go to gym, how do you get strong? By putting more weight on. You want strength? I- I've said this before. So, some of us need to be super careful about our prayers. I don't, God, I don't want to be lonely anymore. I feel isolated. I feel, okay, here is a community for you. I'll stop there. Here's another countercultural one, and I don't like this one. I'll be the first to admit it. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Excuse me? The, the wonderfulness of Jesus is breathtaking. For, for, for someone to say these things, and not just say them, but actually do them, should blow our minds. On the cross... He cries out, Father, forgive them. You're not even on a cross. Like someone took your pencil. God, would you, would you, like, lightning bolts. The wonderfulness of Jesus is breathtaking and superior to any other thing. And so the question is, why would you put your trust in anything or anyone else? When Abraham's Elderly wife, Sarah, laughed at the idea that she would bear a child. The messenger's response was this, is anything impossible for the Lord? That word impossible, Pele. What are you, what are you looking to the heavens and going, impossible? What are, you, what are the things that you're laughing at and not believing that God will do it? Is anything impossible for God? And here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. The Bible only uses this word Pele for God's deeds and words. Never used to describe humanity. Only for God. Never human accomplishments. So I am pleading with you to put your trust in the wonderful, the wonderful This child that will be born, that will be given, is not just called a wonderful, but we're told that he's also a counselor. He's also a counselor. Uh, This word in the Hebrew uh, means not only to counsel and advise, but but it means to, to plan and to execute. It's more than just a therapist. 
And I am all for therapy. I, I believe that all of us should be in therapy. I do. I believe in it. Good biblical therapy. But it's more than just a therapist. It's someone who listens and then lays out a plan for you. A counselor. See, in the ancient days, kings and rulers would have counselors. And these counselors wouldn't just listen, but they would lay out a plan to say, hey, here's what you should do. Here are your next steps. This is no small role. Counselors, they, they carried great wisdom, great wisdom, great wisdom. Let me show you a few places where the word counselor comes up in the scriptures. Speaking of King Solomon, David's son, who is the wisest man to have ever lived, he, he gives guidance. He is a counselor. We see this in 1 Kings uh, chapter 4, verse 34, where it says, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. That people came from far and wide to come and, and, and listen to Solomon, this, this wise man. Uh, they came to listen, to hear, to Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai, Alehenu, Adonai, Echad. Shema. See, this word to listen, it's to hear, but, 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 but it's way bigger than that. It's not just having words come into your ear, but it's also to obey. It is to obey. And you cannot separate the two. I, I don't know if you had a parent like mine. Uh, she's in the room, and so she'll affirm that this is true. Oftentimes, she would look at me and go, One, why did you not listen? And, and oftentimes, maybe grab her own ear. Why did you not listen? I feel like that was stage one. Like I was still in a good place. You know it's over when they grab your ear and they go, why did you not listen? I know these days you gotta get a permission slip from your kid to be able to do that. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, can I grab your, can I, you know what I mean? It's different times, different times. But, but that question, that, that, that question is, is not, did you, did you hear my words? No, 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 she, she knows I heard the words. I mean, I, I think out of 10, maybe, maybe once, I was like, you know what, I actually didn't hear. Like the, 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 the radio was on, it was too, I did. But, but I'm t most of the time, no, I heard you. I just didn't do it. I was disobedient. It's, it's believed here, and I think even in life, that when you listen, you listen to obey. And that's what counselors did. Counselors would give advice. They would, they would lay out a plan. They would say, here's what you are to do. And not only were you to take in that information, but you were to be obedient to it and live it out. To listen is to obey. And we are to do that to the counselor. Jesus is the wise ultimate counselor. Why? Because all that Solomon wrote and spoke of, the wisest man in the world, all that Solomon wrote and spoke of was ultimately pointing to and speaking of Jesus. Yeah. And so here, here's Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived, going, you know what, like I'm saying all these things, but you know what, they all point to Jesus. They all point to Jesus. How, on a, how, how do you know that that is true? Well, Jesus says it himself in John chapter five, verse 39. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's like, I see you guys, man. You're coming to this, you're studying it. You're like, this is, oh, this is nuggets, wisdom. This is amazing. And then you believe in them that you have eternal life. He says, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. They point to me. Jesus can advise his people through anything because he is qualified in ways no human counselor is. In Jesus, we're told that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge exist. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 including the knowledge of all humanity. We see this in Psalm 139, verses one to two. It says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts 
from far away. Like we're sitting here and going, no one understands me. No, Jesus goes, no, I understand you. I know you. And on top of that, I have all knowledge and all wisdom. You put those two together, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it only results in an abundant life. Jesus always knows what we're going through. And he always knows the right course of action. He just does. I I love Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and 16. It says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know why I love this passage so much? Because it screams at me, hey, Oni, you are heard, you are understood, and you are wanted. And I bet those three things, each and every single person in here, like we all want that. We want to be heard, we want to be understood, and then still with that, like, like still to go, okay, so I fully understand that this is who you are, because of what you've said to me, and I've heard everything you've said to me, I understand, like, this is who you are, where most people would be like, yo, now that I understand who you are, no thank you. I'm gonna exit left. Jesus goes, no, I understand who you are, and I still want you. That's the counselor that we need. Psalm 32 verse eight says, as the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Not not only does he say, hey, here's where you need to go. He goes, I'm right with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so you don't have to go, you know what, like he's given me like direction. And and so like the whole time you're like, is this the right way? Like you get to the fork in the road and you're like, I don't, I'm by myself. Like, no, he's he's exactly, I'm still here. I'm still here. Will you listen? Will you listen? I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. And so the question is, where can I find this kind of advice? This kind of counsel? Where can I go to ensure that I am on the best pathway? I hope that that is the question that you're asking. Well, Psalm 119 verse 24 tells us. It says, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. This word testimonies is your law, your decrees, your rules your statutes, your instructions. They are, they are my delight. They are my counselors. We're in here going, I don't know what the next decision is. Like, I don't know what the next step is. I don't, I don't know. It's like, well, everything you need is here. He's given it to us. Everything that we need is here. The question is, will you listen and obey? See, what we see in the first title of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is that there is a son who was born, a son who was given, who can and will be able to counsel you in such a way that it will take you to the miraculous. Let me say that again. That there is one who is able to counsel you, and that counsel will take you to the miraculous. It'll take you to the supernatural. This is why we say he is the wonderful counselor. He doesn't just give you good advice, something that you'll just get by on. No, 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 no. Rather, God, through Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, counsels us in such a way that results to to things that, that, that are just way out of what we could have ever imagined, that far exceed our expectations. The wisdom he gives is able to help you navigate through whatever it is that you're going through. Whatever it is that you're going through. Through the black and the white and through the gray areas of your life. You can trust him. And I I know, I know that in here there's many people who, you're praying for the miraculous. Whatever it is, like you're praying, you're praying for the supernatural in your personal life, maybe in your business, 
in relationships, whatever it is, I know, I know, I know that if I, if I sit with you long enough, I'll hear it. Even folks who are like, you know what, I've got enough in the bank, I'm good for Christmas, bonuses on its way. I know that if we dig deep enough, there is something there that you're going, man, I just, I need God to show up in a supernatural way. And so we desire the miraculous. But the next question is, will you follow his counsel? We pray for folks, and we'll continue to pray for you. Come up, at the end of the gathering, come, I wanna pray for you. And at the end of it, I'll go, okay, so now you need to follow him. I pray in expectation, but will you follow him? Because to say, oh no, I, I want to live a full and prosperous life and not follow him it is like drinking poison in a burning house and saying, I want to live the abundant life. It's foolish. And so many of us, so many of us live this way, waiting for the miraculous, but not following him. And there are so many things in our lives that get in the way. So many things in our lives that get in the way. And, and spoiler alert, okay? Because I know I'm going to say these things and you guys are going to be like, Onne always talks about these things, okay? I am going to continue to talk about these things, the things that get in the way, in, in the way of us experiencing the full and abundant life. Let me go. Money. Oh, I knew it. One is always talking about money. I do. I talk about money a lot because Jesus spoke about money a lot, and I'm just trying to follow Jesus. But the other reason I talk a lot about money is because I understand the grip that money has on our lives. Even me, your pastor. You, you know what we do? Because we believe God calls us to, to give our, our best, our first and our best, to be generous givers every month. This, this isn't like a model. I'm not saying that you should do it, but it's pretty good. Um, Every month we go, okay, it's time to give our first and best. My wife gets on the laptop, and she's like, we need to pray. Father, we're praying that this large amount of money, let's not front, I know, I know you guys look at it and you're like, I have to give all of this. You know, it's easy, like when you make 100 rand, you're like, oh, 10 rand, yeah, sure, I can give. You know, because you know? we lose 10 rand, most of us, it's like, where did I put that 10 rand? We're, But as you continue to grow, <laughs> that 10 rand continues to grow. And so you look at it and you're like, yo, there's so many things that we could do with this money. God, there's so many good things for your kingdom that we could do with this money. And so we pray because we recognize the grip that money has on our hearts. Every month. God, would you use this for your glory, for the advancing of your kingdom? God, we want this money to be like ammunition that we throw at the kingdom of darkness. I mean, imagine you think about your money that way. That the kingdom advances, God, would you use this money to reach more people with the good news of Jesus? Would you save people because this money is going into that? God, would we see marriages restored? Relationships reconciled. And may we experience great joy as we do it. And then, God, would you provide for the things that we need? And not just provide, but God, may we experience prosperity. Ooh, on it, did on it. Did you say prosperity? Yes, because it's here. It's here. It's in the Bible. What am I supposed to do with it? It's here. The dominion will be vast and it's prosperity will never end. Now, I'm not preaching a health and wealth. That, that, that's not, no. That is from the kingdom of darkness. But there is prosperity that is to be experienced. A full life. Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give life and give it to the full. And so may we experience that abundant life. God, we are dreaming for our kids. We are dreaming for our own lives. Would we, would, would we get to enjoy great holidays? Would we, like we can ask God for those things. But money gets in the way. 
and Satan knows it and so he whispers it in our ear. He becomes the counselor, promising supernatural things that he cannot deliver. And so we come up empty, every month, empty. Why? I don't know why. Why am I coming? Why? Here's another one, accolades. Oh, honor, accolades. Why are you always talking about? Because I know, I know in here, guys. Some of the smartest people in the country are in this room. Doctor so-and-so and doctor so-and-so and doctor so-and-so and, doc- and none of the medical doctors. <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's, that's not a dig. That's, that, is, that, is, that, that is honor. That is, like I'm just saying. And, and, and friends, I, I, I want, my desire is for you, if, if, if you desire to do it and you, the opportunity to study, like some of you are going, man, I really want to study further. Man, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for provision. I, I pray that you get into that spot. I pray that you get that master's degree and you cum laude it. I pray that you get that PhD opportunity and you cum laude it. I will pray for you. I'm telling you. But if you elevate that, because you believe that 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 PhD will become my counselor. You will wake up every day empty. And every time you're going, I'm, I'm God, the miraculous. He, I, I really believe that God goes, there is so much I want to do in and through you. Whenever you're ready to surrender to me, we'll get to work. And I'm not just saying that about you individually, I'm talking about rooted as a church. What are the things that we're holding on to going, you know, I got, like we can do this on our own. We can, and he's just going, you, you have no idea what I want to do in and through you. You have no idea. But will you surrender? One more. Identity gets in the way. And this is a crazy one. But there's so many of us searching, searching. The reason the question of the day is like, what, what, is, what is your name? And, and I know many of us really, like I have an incredible name. I could tell you a story about where my name comes from. It's unbelievable. But it pales in comparison to the name that God gives me through his son Jesus by the power of the spirit. And there are things in our lives that are going to be competing for that name. You are a child of God. And he's going to be in your ear going, but can you really be a child of God? How, how does Satan come to Jesus? Jesus. If you are really the son of God. Let's talk a little bit about your identity. Oh, but you have no idea. Like, here's where I failed. Like, disappointment. Uh, Like, I'm really bad here. I said I would never sin again. And uh, so that's why I cannot bear this name. I cannot wear this name. I don't deserve this name. And all of those are true. But because of Jesus' grace, he pours it out on you. Our money, our accolades, and our identity are going to get in the way of experiencing Jesus as the wonderful counselor. And so we're gonna walk through these titles over these next few weeks. And I'm gonna ask these questions over and over and over again. Because I know some of you are sitting here and you're just going, not today. No, I'm gonna hold on to my money. I don't know on it. Like I don't know if I can fully trust that that's what, I'm gonna hold on to my accolades. I'm gonna trust, I'm gonna trust in myself. And I'm gonna pray, I pray before the gathering, I'm gonna pray in the gathering, and I'm gonna pray after the gathering that that God will take a hold of you in such a way that that you have, have, like there is no more more power in you to go, you know what, like I'm holding on, you're gonna go, I'm gonna fully surrender. I'm gonna call the band up as I ask these two questions in closing. If you believe that Jesus truly is a wonderful counselor. Will you follow him? Will you follow him? Will you trust him? Because you you say you believe. You say you believe that he is the wonderful counselor. So will you follow him? Will you trust him? Will you surrender everything to him and go, I'm praying for the supernatural and then I'm going to follow you. Everything that you say in your word, I'm just gonna follow you. I'm gonna be like those servants at the wedding where Jesus turns water to wine. His mom says to the servants, hey, do do whatever he says that you should do. 
that should be the posture of our lives. Whatever he said, like what? Because he's the wonderful counselor. If we follow him, he will lead us to places that we could never imagine or think. And so my question is, will we follow him? And will we trust him? And so eyes closed, heads bowed. Father, I want to take a moment just to pray. To pray for every single person here in this room. You know what keeps folks up at night. You know the things that they are longing for, the things that they desire, the, 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 the miraculous things that they look to the heavens and going, God, would you, would you do these things in my life? God, I'm praying that those folks would be honest about that. That they would say, God, we, we need you. I need you to miraculously show up because of my health. If, if that's you, if, if, if you're sitting here and you're, you're going, I, I need God to show up miraculously for my health, I'm gonna ask you, just, just raise your hand. There's something in your, in, in your body that you're going, man, it's just, it's keeping me from, from, from being and doing all that I am supposed to do. I'm talking physically. But, but if you're sitting here and you're going, God, I need you to miraculously show up. It's not just physically, but it's, it's mentally and emotionally. I feel drained. I'm exhausted. I'm tired of pretending and performing, and I need you. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're in your hand and you're going, ah, God, I, I need you to, to show up miraculously in, in a relationship. There is a relationship in your life that, it, that, that, that you, know, you know. It keeps you up like you've tried to ignore it. And it's still the energy, like, I just, I don't know what to do. There is brokenness there, whether it's from you or from the other person. And you need God to, to supernaturally step in. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're in here and you're going, God, I need you to supernaturally show up with my finances. You're recognizing that, that, that there's somewhere in your life where, where you took the wrong turn and, and, and you began to live beyond your means and, and, and you, didn't, you didn't trust God. You began to, to trust in your own resources and you're going, I, man, everyone is talking about Christmas and, 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 and the, the joys of it and I just, I feel overwhelmed because I feel like I'm not even gonna make it to the end of the month. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If you're in here and you feel isolated and alone, you need to be heard, you need to be understood, and you just want to be wanted. Our wonderful counselor can meet your need. And so, Father God, I pray for the folks in here raising hands, and, and maybe someone just. Maybe it didn't hit one of those things or, or they're still thinking through it or they want to process, whatever it is, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would enter into hearts right now. Take a hold of them. And let them see you for who you truly are, our wonderful counselor. And then God, I pray that we would be obedient to everything that you have commanded us to do to take those steps of faith. We are in desperate need of a savior. This world is in desperate need of a savior. We've tried everything and it just doesn't work. And so over this Advent series, Lord, I'm praying that there would be this overwhelming sense from not just us, but from our colleagues, our neighbors, our friends, our family members, this overwhelming sense of surrendering to you. And that ultimately would lead to us worshiping you. My prayer is that every voice in here would be able to cry out hallelujah. And not because it's words on a screen, but because Jesus, you're in their lives. That you have saved them and reconciled them back to the Father. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so would you do a work that only you can do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.